We're in a, continuing in our series here about uh, Maranatha at the movies. Now, it's not so much a, uh, a way to add some light issues. In fact, sometimes uh, when we do this series from summer to summer, we uncover some very deep theological points, but we find them in the movies that are in our culture today. Movies today um, rely on um, hitting the, 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 the hot buttons of culture and, and hot buttons of our lives and in order to um, build their box office receipts. Again, their motivation may be uh, different, but right now we know that in that time that God has the answer for all of those cultural concerns that the movie producers and directors and, and actors bring forth. Today we're going to be looking at The Lion King. And uh, The Lion King tells a story, for those of you who didn't know, um, I get myself in trouble, and so I'll, I'll go to our resident movie e uh, expert here. What year did The Lion King come out, Josiah? Test. 1994? 96. Four. 96. Four. 96. I... <laughs> Okay, somebody's challenging our movie theater but, uh, expert. But in any sense, the, uh, it started a long time ago. And I don't know if you're, you're like you were in the 90s. Um, I know even in the 80s when I married my wife, I was, uh, I was very, very proud of my attire. Unfortunately, from the 70s. Um, <laughs> and so my angel flights, if you remember the polyester angel flights and all that stuff. Uh, she helped me get rid of those very rapidly. And, uh, yes, yeah. and I don't know about you. Where, if, for those of you who were in the 90s, many of us in here haven't, uh, weren't even born when Lion King came out. But for those of us who were, um, have you changed from the 90s? You know, uh, unless you're watching Seinfeld and Friends reruns over and over and over again, uh, which many of my kids are. Um, you know, we, we move on from things. We grow from that. And the Lion King tells the story of, of Simba, which is Swahili for lion. It's a young lion who is to, to succeed his father, Mufasa, as king of the pride lands. However, after Simba's parent, uh, parental, paternal, I should say, Uncle Scar murders Mufasa, Simba's manipulated into thinking he was responsible and he flees into exile, only to return later as an adult to take back his homeland from Scar with the help of his friends Timon and Pumbaa to fulfill his purpose and become the true king. All kids of all ages love this story for whatever reason, and so it's a great story. But at its heart, this story is about finding our purpose, finding who we are and what we're here for. You know, three of life's greatest questions, whether you're a Christian, a God follower, uh, an agnostic, or an atheist. Three of life's greatest questions are, number one, the question of existence. Why am I alive? Why am I even here in the first place? The second is the question of significance. Does my life even matter? Is it being useful for anything? And the third is a question of intention. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Not how did I get here, but why am I here? Do I have a purpose in being? Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist, said, I don't know the meaning or the purpose of life, but it looks as if something were meant by it. Isaac Asimov, as far as I can see, there is no purpose in life. Even our Bible heroes, Jeremiah 20, verse 18. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. Isaiah 49, 4. And I replied, but my work seems so useless. I've spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose, yet I leave it all in the Lord's hands. I will trust God for my reward. You know, those are all tragic statements. But the greatest tragedy is not death. The greatest tragedy is to live without a purpose. For it is true that every day lived outside your purpose is a day wasted. And we need to remember that. That every day we go without our purpose, without seeking it, finding it, and following through on it, is a wasted day. So how does one know your, uh, that your purpose and finding it will be a help in your life? Well, we're going to look real briefly here at Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. Paul says this, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So, I see five reasons why seeking our purpose is useful in our life. Number one, knowing your purpose gives meaning to your life. Notice Paul says, I, I press on to possess that 
perfect possession for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Number two, knowing your purpose simplifies your life. He said, but I focus on this one thing. So much of our life is dedicated to all of these stressful pieces in our life, but we need to focus on one thing, and this helps us to do that. In fact, number three is knowing your purpose focuses your life even further, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Fourthly, knowing your purpose motivates your life. It gives you passion. You're not just striving and succeeding as life. You're actually thriving in life. He said, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive that heavenly prize, which leads to point number five, that knowing your purpose prepares us for eternity's sake, the, the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So I ask you today, those who are watching online or those who are here physically with us, are you searching for that perfect career, that perfect relationship, that perfect lifestyle, so that you can find your purpose in life? According to... Uh, psychologists here are the three of the most common forces that drive people today. People are driven either by guilt and fear, or by anger and resentment, or by wealth and materialism. So what is it that motivates you to make those big decisions in your life on a daily basis? Is it your job, your money, your family, your power, your success, your, sec your security? Because real security can only be found in that which can never be taken from you, and that's your relationship with God. Simba tried to live as easy a life as possible, just living for himself in the movie. And I've learned life is pretty brief. I probably only have 50, 60 really good years left in me. <laughs> okay, maybe not quite that many, but I do realize that whatever time I have before me, I want to live that brief time for something that matters, something that is actually going to outlast me. Dr. James Dobson, you may recall, that was president of Focus on the Family. He resigned from that. But in college, his goal was to become the school tennis champion. And he felt so proud when his trophy was prominently placed in the school's trophy cabinet. And years later, somebody mailed him that trophy. They had found it in the rubbish bin when the school was being remodeled. And thought he might want it. Dobson says, given enough time, all your trophies will be trashed by someone else. We seek after, we desire after, and those things will be gone. <clears throat> 1 John 2, 15-16 says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. In order to do all that, I need to find out God's purpose for me. God has a purpose for me, and you as well. Psalm 139, 16, a very famous passage that David wrote. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. In Ephesians 2, 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long, long ago. A masterpiece. He designed us. He has shaped our background. He's designed our personalities, our pimples, our dreams. He's everything we are, he designed. So all those inferiority issues that you feel that you don't quite match up, God disagrees. God created the, you the way you are. You might like to change this or that, but God didn't. And God wouldn't, and God won't. It's not just our bodies, though, that he's designed, but the whole of our situation and it's right to get to work right where we are. The situation that you find yourself can be very disarming. It can be very stressful. But God has plan and purpose for all of it. And you just need to seek where that is and what it is from it. <coughs> and then it says, created anew in Christ Jesus. This is not something that we create. It's not something we can do by our own power, our own um, logic and reasoning. It's by God through Christ Jesus and then he talks about good plans, or some translations are good works. His purpose, basically. We were created to do the things that he <coughs> wanted us to do before we were even in our mother's womb. He knew the purpose he had for our lives, and we need to seek it. Now, good works can be thought of as in two categories. There's general works, like, for instance, we're all to love our neighbor. We shouldn't uh, um, cheat on our spouses. We shouldn't steal. Those are good general works, but there's also specialized works, specific activities that only you can do. That God put you in a spot, gave you skills and talents that only you can possess, 
and he intends you to use them for his purpose. Now, God is magnificent enough that he'll find another way if you don't follow that purpose. But what a neat thing to know God's purpose for our lives and then to follow it. And that's the attitude we ought to have. The world tries to have us think what we want when our only concern ought to be what God wants in our life. So are you worrying about who to marry, what career path to take, where to live, what's going on in my life, how am I dealing with all this? Romans 12, 2 has an answer there. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the very way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So he's saying, you know, follow after my eternal purposes, and these other things will fall into place. Don't, don't worry about them. Worry about where you are with me. And in fact, God has five eternal purposes in our lives, at least five, but we're going to go over five today. Areas that perhaps you and I need to work on. So as we go through them, see where you may be lacking in some of these. The first one is to connect with God personally. It's the number one purpose of your life. You may feel that, no, my... My talents, my skills, my job, my relationships are... No, your number one purpose in life, my number one purpose in life, is to connect with God. Colossians 1, verse 16 said, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. That's the key. We were created for him. These, these things are permanent over temporary things like power and property and personality and prestige. A relationship with God supersedes all of that. In fact, true happiness is knowing God. If you really want to be happy, it means nothing, anything else you do but getting right with God. That is the key to being truly happy. <coughs> now, we're talking here about really knowing God, not just knowing about God or knowing of God. You know, I, I know of James Earl Jones. He's the voice of Mufasa. I know that he was born on January 17. I know that he's 88 years old. I know that he was born in Mississippi. He survived, I mean, he has survived, I should say, two wives. Uh, he has only one child, one son. His name is Flynn. He's the voice of Darth Vader. And uh, he's got two Tony Awards, two Emmy Awards, one Grammy Award. But just knowing about him doesn't mean I can call him up and say, hey, can we do lunch? First of all, not allowed his number, and even if I had it, he probably wouldn't pick it up, right? I don't know him personally. I know of him. I know about him, but I don't know him. And it's the same with God. We need to know God, not just know about God. You know, King David in Scripture had many failures, many blemishes. You know, he, he uh, had an adulterous affair. He uh, committed murder in order to cover up that affair. He had many, many um, failures. But notice what God said in Acts 13, 22. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. With all of his failures, with all of his blemishes, with all of his concerns and problems, his number one goal was still to know God and for God to know him and to be right with his God. In Acts 13, 36, down the way from that, for after David had done the will of God in his own generations, he died and was buried with his ancestors. He'd done the will of God. He had done his purpose. He had fulfilled his purpose. What, what a neat epitaph I would want for myself. That I fulfilled the purpose that God had for me. Nothing less, nothing more. Just the purpose of what God had for me. And then later in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, he was talking to his son Solomon. He says, Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart, knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So here's the key this morning. These others are um, subservient to this one. You must have this one. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Because all these others won't matter if not. From the day you were born, that was God's primary purpose for your life. Ephesians 1.5 said God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family for, by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. We are to be adopted into the family of God, God's own family. And he does that not through anything we do, but through Jesus Christ. And that is his great pleasure. 
God has wanted you to know him, to be a part of his family from the very beginning of time. But you know this getting to know God's thing is both a point, a specific point in our life, when we didn't know him and then we start knowing him, and it's a pursuit of constantly getting to know him greater and greater and greater than we ever have. Secondly, we need to commit to God's church. That's the reason God created the church. Not necessarily Maranatha. Maranatha is part of a larger church, but he created the church as a whole to find and fulfill his purposes for his followers. The church is not a building. In fact, Maranatha proves that every single week we meet, we're renting an office complex. It's not the stained glass that you would normally associate with a church. It's not the pews and the pulpit and the big pulpit Bible and all of that. We don't have any of that. The church is not the building. The church is the people that enters the building. It's people, it's family, it's where we get recharged every week. We get realigned with God's purposes for our lives to grow and together and to love together, to give together, to live together, to serve together. That's the purpose of the church. And when we're, when we're not there, we don't have to go to church to be good Christians. But when we miss that, we're missing something that God had put into place to naturally help us to, to regain that, that uh, and realign with God's purposes. Acts 2.42 tells about the early church. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. They didn't do any of all of this at <coughs> arm's length, right? They did it together. They grew together. They loved together. They served together. And Paul tells us, or whoever the author is, I should say, but perhaps Paul, in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 25, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Can we safely say that we're closer now to Jesus returning than they were when those words were written? Certainly. And so it's even more important that we not neglect our meeting together, but to encourage one another. It's easy not to commit, but when you do commit, then it's also when you will really grow. Thirdly, you need to cultivate godly habits. We are the sum of our habits. For good or bad. When you die, you don't get to take anything with you. I remember seeing this picture of a, of a hearse with a U-Haul. Um, that's not how it works, folks. You don't, you don't get to take it with you when you leave, right? The, everything is going to someone else, or it's going to be thrown away. It doesn't matter how many uh, Instagram followers you have, or, or how much uh, uh, money is in your possession. All of it is useless, right? But you will take your character. You'll take who you are becoming. Who you become in Christ is so much more important than anything else you are pursuing today. That's what Matthew was talking about last week. Mm -hmm. was pursuing God at all costs. 1 Timothy 4, 7, So do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. You have to train spiritually. Are you working hard at something? Are you working hard at your job to make sure that you're... Uh, um, getting what you need out of that. Are you working hard at your relationship, your health, your enjoyable activities? All of these things are good to pursue. All of these things are, are good to follow after. But when those things are gone, who you are is all that will remain. And we need to train spiritually. Train yourself, Paul said to Timothy, to be godly. So how do you develop godly habits? Again, I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, or if you even were, that you go online and watch um, Matthew's message from last week, it was a very good one. But how do we develop godly habits? Well, one thing is to worship together, you know, week after week after week. Hopefully, as I bring God's word to you all, we are able to digest all of that and, and use it to edify ourselves. Not my words, but his. And uh, so I'd encourage you to be here and to bring a friend and, and to grow as a group together in that. But prayer time, make sure that your prayer time, are you opening every day with prayer? Even if it's just a brief prayer, or a long, a long prayer or short, it doesn't matter as long as you're opening the day saying, you know what, I need to refocus. Today I've got so many things in my lineup, so many things on my schedule, but I'm going to start the day focused on you, Lord. And then there's the Bible study and the Bible reading. I don't know if you guys have a, a Bible reading plan. Karen and I have uh, uh, been in one. It gets bogged down at times. Um, I know, in fact, I, I've trained my... Uh, <clears throat> I shouldn't say this, but I train my phone to read through it at 1.75 speed. Um, and that way I can get more in 
in the morning time. But I'm still paying attention to it and all that. But the, uh, I love my Bible reading, but do, you have, do we have it enough? Is it ingrained in us? And then groups. You know, it is great to meet together on Saturday morning. It is great together to catch up and find out how we've been doing and everything. But we need to be connecting during the week as well. And so we need to pursue groups. Grant and I have been talking about the, doing that here at Maranatha. Elizabeth has too. And so what we need to do is find a way that we can challenge ourselves to not just see each other once a week for a couple hours and move on, but we see each other on a regular basis so that we can encourage one another, be accountable to one another. The fourth thing I would suggest we can do is to care for God's people. You know, um, as we grow, first we're dealing with ourselves and having to figure out that God's in the throne, not ourselves, and that life isn't just about us. But part of our purpose is to serve other people. Now notice that we serve them not from what we can get from them, but what we can give to them, unlike these two here. friend Simba, but not for his benefit, but for their benefit. That's not what we serve others for. At Maranatha, we want to love and serve people, whether it's our own people or serving those outside the church. You know, John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you want people to know that you are Christians, if you if you say that you're a Christian, it's not because you care uh, that you're carrying a big Bible or that you're perfect. It's because you love one another. It's our love that will determine whether we are seen as Christian or not. The way we serve and we care. Now, there are so many here who serve at Maranatha. We're a little church, but everybody kicks in. And not just those who lead from the front with worship, and that's fantastic. But, um, um, you know, we got Jeremy in the back with online church. We've got Matthew and Gabriella right now doing the PowerPoint for this. Uh, we have uh, those who are uh, supporting with the, ch the kids watching the kid ministry, those who do, um, you know, the behind the scenes, like the accounting, the bookkeeping, and all of that, our executive team that voluntarily runs this church through the year, um, those folks are serving, but they do so gladly because they're serving not just the church, they're serving Jesus Christ in the process. So we need to find a place to serve, both our people and those outside the church, Mark 16, 15. And then he, Jesus, told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. We're going to go into all the world and proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. And the world includes all aspects and places where people live and interact. Jesus lived in the world. He moved around different parts of society. He met with religious leaders and tax collectors and children and needy people and sinners all kinds of people from all walks of life of different spheres. He was a friend of the sinners. He spent time with them. They saw his life. They heard his words. They felt his heart. He was comfortable around them. Yet he didn't compromise his lifestyle nor his character. Matthew 23, 11 says, The greatest among you must be a servant. And fifthly, lastly, celebrate God's work. I mean, if you think about it, worship is just that. Is worship. God is worthy of our praise and honor. So I ask you today, ask yourselves that through life, whether here at church or in the rest of the week, am I happy about the things that make God happy? Or am I happy about the things that make me happy? 
that's a very telling thing. We need to look over all of these purposes that we've mentioned this morning. Which ones do you need to go back and work on more so than some of the others? Connect with God personally. Commit to God's church. Cultivating godly habits. Caring for God's people. Or celebrating God's work. What are you pursuing? What is your main purpose? Are you looking to someone or something else for your ultimate purpose? Because first, he wants you to pursue him. C.S. Lewis put it like this, one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to do an audit on your life, a final exam before you enter eternity. In our household, we've been watching Josiah study for all of his finals. And I know Elizabeth's working really hard on her finals. And, and final exams is a time when you really stress out. But you know, the good news is that God wants you to pass his final exam. He's already given you the questions he's going to ask at the end of life. He's going to ask two things. First, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? God's not interested in our religious background, what uh, doctrines we hold dear, or, or what denomination we're in, our religious views. The only thing that will matter at that time is, did you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Did you learn to love him? Did you learn to trust him? Did you choose to follow him? And the second question would be, what did you do with what I gave you? How did you invest your time, your skills, the, the money I entrusted to you? What did you make of the opportunities and the energies and the relationships I created for you? Did you spend them on yourself or did you invest them for me and my purposes? And we'll close the day with the verses we read earlier from Philippians. Paul wrote, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling. Let us pray.